Hi, everyone, and welcome to this live lesson, uh, all about exploring the deep ocean, the submersible um, explorer live lesson. It's my great delight um, that we're going to be having a real life ocean explorer at the end of the lesson. Uh, but without further ado, let's go and join the Ocean Census team and Professor Alex Rogers out in Tenerife. Alex, good afternoon. Hello. How are you? Hi, Jamie. Very good. Yeah. Fantastic. And you're out in Tenerife with a project called Ocean Census. We're loving working with you guys. Can you briefly tell our wonderful classes what Ocean Census is? is all about well ocean census is a project funded by an organization called the nippon foundation and our main mission is to discover new life discover new species in the ocean discover new life i mean it feels like there's we should have discovered lots of life how much life in the ocean is out there waiting to be discovered well, uh, that's a, a very difficult question to answer at the moment, but um, we've only discovered somewhere between 10 to 25 percent of the estimated number of species which live in the ocean, which at the moment we think is somewhere between a million and two million species. Wow. So we've got another sort of like 800,000 plus species to discover potentially. Indeed, we we do yes. That's a lot of, a lot of work for you and the team. And you're out in Tenerife at the moment. Uh, what what's taking you to this part of the world? Well, Tenerife is a really interesting one for us because, of course, it's part of Spain. Um, uh, so really, uh, uh, part of Europe at, at the moment. So you'd think that the waters of Tenerife have been quite well explored but actually we're discovering uh quite quite a lot of new species here so this kind of tells us that even in waters which we think have, have been well investigated in fact we um don't know as much about the biological diversity the number of species that that live here brilliant Alex, uh, we've got this great three-part lesson, I think, today. We've, we've got, you're going to tell us about this amazing submersible, which I can see behind you, uh, to learn yeah. about. We've got some great footage that you've been taking down in the ocean um, and some amazing species and animals you're going to you're gonna share with us. And then we're going to talk about how different animals are suited or adapted to, to some of these really crazily difficult and different uh, habitats that we find in the ocean as well. Yeah, so, that'd be great. Looking forward to all this. We've got uh, a few shout outs before we dive into finding out how a submersible actually works. Uh, so make sure you've got your student sheets ready. We'll come to that in a bit. But um, shout out to Class B children, Ashton St. Peter's Primary in Dunstable in Bedfordshire. So hi to everybody in Year 5 Badger class there. And to Amaya, who is homeschooled, wonderful to have you with us. Alex, you've got a submersible behind you. We're going to yeah. start by looking at these amazing bits of technology. Uh, classes, you've got a uh, submersible worksheet um, to have a look at student sheet. It's got six different items on it um, just to look through just to sort of the different parts uh, and what we'll do with Alex, there are a few things you can just point out to us, and then we can go through in a bit more systematic way to make sure we've we've got those main parts of the submersible all noted down. But Alex, just just to give us a brief introduction, you know, why you as a scientist, um, an, an explorer, want to use this bit of, bit of kit behind you. Well, um, submersibles give us an unrivaled view of the ocean floor. Uh, we can manoeuvre in all three direct dimensions, if you like. Um, we can see the interplay between you and the surface. And this means that sub submersibles are very good for exploring complex terrain underwater, whereas uh, a robot which is fixed to a ship by a cable 
uh, that cable can be a real hindrance if you're exploring overhangs or other very complex uh, pieces of submarine terrain like a, an underwater mountain, for example. Alex, you, you've used these a lot. I mean, how, how many submersible dives, just give classes watching, I mean, how, how many submersible dives have you done? If you, or is it just too many? Uh, it, it's never too many. Um, I've actually completed my 50th dive uh, two days ago, uh, which was a great dive off him. Yeah. Brilliant. And and just, you know, these, these, are, these are bits of kit that um most young people i think probably all young people watching won't, won't have been up close and personal with a with a submersible we've got a um a few things that you can probably point to and then we've got some clips that we can we can we can show as well i just want before we look at the outside um i just want to show um classes sort of the inside and i think we've got a, a, a little sequence that you shot for us yesterday of going inside the submersible and what what it looks like uh, from the inside. We'll just check check when that's playing and just if you can describe like going through the hatch in, in into the sub. Uh, do that now. Yeah. 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 Um, so actually, uh, the sub submersible is launched. You can see here. This is a solid steel sphere with these viewports in it. Uh, which you can see, uh, they have windows, if you like, which are made of acrylic. And somebody's going to hand me one of these right now. Um, so these are built to withstand the enormous pressure that uh, is exerted on the submersible when it dives. They're solid uh, acrylic and extremely expensive. So, um, and just to demonstrate what that pressure can do, this is a, a standard polystyrene coffee cup, uh, which we've taken down to about 230 meters uh, with us. And you can see how uh, the pressure has crushed that cup down to uh, probably about a half to a third of its original size. And also the texture of it is completely different. It's no longer squashy, it's like solid. And that that huge pressure. You've obviously got the, the pressure hull, that that white that white piece there, and then and then the viewports you're talking about. Before you were talking about how submersibles are really great for tricky underwater terrain, and I think there's probably two two things there. Just to mention, I think the first one is the thrusters, uh, and then the ballast tanks as a, as the second piece. I don't know whether we can see those from where we are, but just to sort of indicate where they might be on the sub. Yeah, you can just about see one of the thrusters here. So um, essentially the thrusters are almost like cylinders with propellers inside them. And they point in different directions. They're fixed, so they can't move around. But we have several on the submersible that point in different directions and enable the pilot to actually maneuver the submersible around in almost any direction uh, that, that you need. Um, so they're a very important part of the submersible. They're its only form of locomotion. We need to be neutrally buoyant at depth, so we're not like sat on the seafloor, unable to move or floating up towards the surface. So um, there are a number of different buoyancy systems on the submersible. One thing to point out is that a lot of this yellow area is made out of what's called syntactic foam. And this is a special material which contains almost microscopic glass spheres, uh, which of course give it buoyancy embedded in a resin. And it's a very special uh, material that gives the submersible a certain amount of buoyancy just by itself. And then we've got variable ballast tanks, which allow us to adjust the buoyancy by pumping water out and letting air expand in those tanks to really trim the buoyancy neatly so that we're perfectly neutral at depth. 
So those are like cylinders which you sort of if if, if you want to sort of go down a bit, then you, you put water in, and then if you want to sort of come up, sort of the balance that you'd be put you put air in, you you change that. That's amount. right. Yeah, yeah. So you might um, uh, you might experience some of this if you're in a swimming pool, for example, and you know you let some air out for your lungs, you'll sort of feel yourself starting to sink. So you can trim your own buoyancy uh, with the amount of air that you've got in in your lungs. Right, Alex. But this, you know, what you described sounds great, great fun. But you're down there doing science, and I think we can see at the front there's some bits of kit that really help you on that front. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are a number of things that we want to do. First of all, we want to get great images, great film of uh, the animals that we want to discover and sample. Um, uh, where they're actually living. So we get a nice image of those animals, where they live and what they look like in their natural environment. And you'll see uh, just here is a big uh, pan and tilt camera. That's a camera we can move around, zoom in, zoom out and focus with. Underneath that uh, camera are fixed two lasers. And those lasers are exactly parallel which you can see here, yeah. Um, and those come in various types, so they can be electric, they can be hydraulic. This one's a, a hydraulic one. And uh, they can have different levels of sophistication in how they're jointed. Um, and we use that manipulator to pick up animals, rocks, all sorts of things, and we often put them into... Uh, what we call our bio boxes, which are these green boxes you can see here, or we can use them to deploy these coring tubes. And they're literally a, a plastic tube with a, a metal T-bar on the top, which the tool grabs, and you put it into sand or mud, and it takes a sample of the sand or mud, and you put it back on the submarine to bring it back to the surface. Fascinating. Uh, Alex, I mean, a a absolutely amazing Th thank you so so much i know we've probably got some follow-on questions to do but we're just going to give um classes about 30 seconds or so just to consolidate uh student sheets make sure all that amazing information that alex has given us so far you've got that and then we'll come back in in about some 20 30 seconds time uh, and and we'll, we'll 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 go through some of the amazing ocean life you've been spotting brilliant Amazing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the next section. There's dive um, coming through. And uh, we've got a dive log uh, student sheet for you. And that's got a few of the conditions. Um, normally you record the time, the depth you go to, those those types of things on a, on a dive log, uh, what the weather is like. Uh, and we can, we can, we can, what's the weather like today, um, Alex, at in Tenerife, so they can have that, have that on their sheet. Yeah, it's a little, little bit breezy, but a, a stunning clear day today. Stunning clear day. Brilliant. And then we've got three sections for you to look at. I think the first one, which we're going to focus on quite a lot, is 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 the names of the animals that you see and the other forms of life. There's then a section to look at any physical features, and we'll be using look at a couple of science words for that. And then the last bit is a sort of feelings piece, and it'd be be great, Alex. You know, maybe it's whatever whatever point you you know you want is just to, to describe what it's like 
uh, from an emotional point of view to go go in a, in, in a submersible. Um, but just to, to start off with, well, there's a series of, of amazing footage you've been able to send through to us at, at differing depths. And I think the first set of footage has come through uh, from a dive team, and you've been working with you've been working with divers as well out, out there. Yeah, that's right. We've been working with a, a technical dive team from Finland. Uh, they're specially trained to do um, diving science, essentially. Amazing, and and some of the very cool creatures you, you you've been seeing. Um, I've got this this lovely uh, thing of of a, of a lobster in its natural habitat. Uh, on this very dark uh, sandy seabed tell us a little bit about about the sort of that sort of invertebrate form of life that you've been seeing yeah that that particular animal is a, a rock lobster panyolirus um they're actually protected in the canary islands they've been overfished and there's not many of them left um so you can't sample those as a scientist um, but we can observe them and let our uh, Canarian partners know where we actually see those animals living on the seafloor. Amazing. And, and, and interestingly, also in the shallows, um, something I've, I miss and I haven't, haven't seen for, for a long time ha, ha, has been a, a, a green turtle um, out, out there as well, which, which are, I mean, they're pretty widespread across the world's oceans. They are, yes. I mean, I've seen them in the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, and obviously they're here in the Canary Islands as well. Uh, they eat marine plants, seagrass, and probably uh, what we call macroalgae or seaweed uh, as well. Um, of course, they're an animal which uh, have a particular problem with uh, being entangled in uh, human debris, things like old fishing gear, and they also tend to swallow quite a lot of plastic as well. So, um, you know, it's amazing to see them, but they're animals which are, are threatened by human activities. And that's something, talking about sort of plastics, that's something we can all look to reduce and and, and go towards eliminating um, so certainly single-use plastic in, in, our, in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, uh, there are international negotiations to try and reduce the amount of plastic uh, that we're we're using. Amazing, and and I think if we go start to go a bit deeper, and I think there's this difference between what I'm seeing from the stuff you sent through, video you sent through, is that some of these animals live on the sea floor or the seabed, whether it's sandy or rocky, and then some live in the water column. And it's amazing shots of 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 I think the the barracuda um, that I've been seeing these huge. I mean, I've, I've only seen them sort of on on their own or in small groups, but this these is just huge groups of barracuda. Yeah, I mean, they're even waiting for us in the harbour as we're leaving um, Rabazul here uh, on the um, uh, southeastern coast of uh, of Tenerife. Uh, and we see them very frequently in shallow water uh, just outside the harbour here. They're really beautiful fish. They're, they have this almost perfect spindle shape, so they're extremely streamlined, and they can move very, very fast. Uh, and, of course, they're predators, so they move fast to catch uh, other fish. I mean, and, and in the footage you've been sent through, one of the things I noticed is they're quite often mixed up with what I assume is their prey fish, but they don't seem too bothered. Do I don't know whether you can tell us sort of do they sort of like hang out and chill out for a bit and then use all the energy in short bursts to try and feed? They do tend to. I mean, I've seen them hunting in the harbours over on Lanzarote, another one of the islands in the Canaries, and they do just that. They kind of almost make out that they're not interested and then suddenly they'll dive in to, to grab some prey. So, uh, so yeah, quite lethal uh, predators. And, and then we, we're, we're going a bit deeper uh, and there's um, there's some jacks, I think we can see. And then there's, I think there's a very bright red patch on, on the rocky seabed there. Um, and I'm 
wonder whether you can um let us know i think in one of the shots you, you, you sent through what what that what that might be um the red part is that uh an area with the uh, whip corals on I, th I think it's it's a bit um it's a bit shallower um um which is i think this is maybe a type of sponge oh yeah i'm not sure yeah yeah the um so as we go down obviously you start to lose light and um you come into what we call the technical term for it is the mesophotic zone but most people call it the twilight zone so there is light there during the daytime but at that depth around the Canary Islands, between 80 to 120 meters, we see these beautiful rocky reefs, which are covered in sponges and also uh, really stunning um, Gorgonian corals. They look like these sort of two dimensional trees, uh, very brightly colored, yellows, reds, purples and stony corals as well these thick branching tree-like colonies they're a dull orange color with these bright white polyps they look like sea anemones uh sort of growing on them um it's a really nice area and we've been picking up a, a high diversity of uh species in that particular zone because I think I think um, and I and I know I'm making life very difficult for our producer jumping around these different clips. But if we go to um, one, which I think we've got this lovely shot um, of whip coral. I think there's a sort of like there's a there's a scorpion fish hanging out in one corner. There's an octopus hanging out in another corner. Uh, it seems like it's you you expect the deep sea to be quite barren, but there's a there's a lot going on, um, and you know. This whip coral is, is that looks like a plant, but it's not, is it? That's right. Yeah. So the whip corals are most abundant at about well below two hundred meters. So they're truly deep sea animals. We, uh, us scientists, classify the deep sea as starting at two hundred uh, meters, and those whip corals are actually colonies of many many polyps. They're um, uh, sort of clonal organisms, and they have that whip-like shape. You'll notice they're also spiral in shape as well. And that's an adaptation so that when cone is flowing, the whips bend over and they're exposing as many of their polyps as possible to capture particles of food in the water that's flowing past them. Um, so again, superbly adapted to uh, these types of island slope environments where you get very strong current flows. So they're not rigid and they don't get broken. They're actually flexible. And and then we've got this lovely sort of like broken, and I think there's spots of, of yellow sponge, and then these amazing looking fish with sort of black bars on them. They're sort of, I think they're bl black tail comas. Yeah. How how they look like they're a surface fish, but they're down quite deep. What 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 what's going on there? Yeah, they're uh, uh, they're from a group of fish called the Ceranidae, um, almost all of which are, are predatory fish, and you could almost picture them as a small grouper. And groupers are in on many uh, reefs and, and warmer parts of the world. They're big, big. Uh, predatory fish. This is quite a small grouper. Um, you can see it in quite shallow water up to 10, 15 meters deep, um, but they do go down into mesophotic uh, or twilight zone depths as well, down to 100, 120 meters. And, and then I think this, for, for me, when someone told me, um, you know, about sponges properly for the for the, for the first time, and I don't know whether we can go back to the to to the, the clip with the sort of yellow yellow uh, sponges on, on on the sort of rubbery bottom. That there that that's an animal, a sponge. I mean, this is for me. That's yeah. a thing to learn. It is an animal, but it's probably the most primitive type of animal. It was probably the first. Uh, one of the first multicellular life forms that evolved uh, in the ocean. 
and they're particle feeders. So they have these cells with a, almost like a little tail or a, 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 a yeah, I guess a, a little tail would be the best way to describe it. And they beat and cause water to flow through the sponge and it extracts particles from uh, the water. But sponges play a really important role in shallow tropical reefs and possibly in some of these deeper areas as well. And that is because they can actually absorb dissolved organic matter, dissolved carbon, and they turn it into particulate carbon, which many other animals can eat. And uh, this is why that they're, they're ecologically hugely important in these reef environments. And when you're talking about dissolved um, organic matter, that's a bit like when you put like frosties in your in, in milk and that sugar comes off and the sugar tastes sweeter. You're putting that energy in, into the liquid and then the sponge can turn it back into cornflakes again so that other, yeah. other, other breakfast cereals do exist, but other than other animals... <laughs> Can can eat that sort of like that 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 whole whole food. Absolutely, yeah. So you can imagine lots of marine animals are quite slimy. They release that slime into the water. That becomes dissolved, and the sponges can convert that back to particulate matter. Amazing, Alex. I, I could ask you so many more questions. Unfortunately, we're we're going to move on to adaptations very soon. In your classrooms, you've been sending through amazing questions. Keep on doing that. Take a little bit of time just to have a look at your dive log. Make sure you've got everything. If you haven't got something, we'll, we can come to it. Put a question in. We'll come to it um, after the next next section. But we'll just give you a, a little moment, and then we'll come on to some some of the alien like uh, deep sea creatures and their adaptations. Brilliant. Um, Alex, we're now going to go even deeper, even deeper than the twilight zone. We're going into really, really deep, and we're going to be looking at one of the things I always think is, why do, does everything in the real real deep look like something out of a science fiction alien film? Um, there's a worksheet for this um, based on the anglerfish, which you can share around, but there's some other creatures, Alex. I think we're just going to talk through this for sort of four or five minutes, and then we'll get to the Q&A. And it is really sort of why do they look like aliens? I think we've got a, an isopod, giant isopod up first. Well, the, the reason is that the deep ocean is an environment which is completely different in many respects to the environment we're used to up near the surface. So it's, it's dark. Uh, it's often very cold. Um, there is very, very little food around. Uh, and of course, it's at very high, high pressure. So the animals have to be especially adapted to live in this zone. And, and uh, an isopod is it, it's, a, it's essentially a foot long, as far as I can work out, woodlouse or roly poly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've seen one of these when I was doing a dive on, uh, in the Indian Ocean at a depth of about 3,700 metres. And they grow enormous, I mean, like this size. Uh, so it's an example of gigantism in the deep sea because the shallow water representatives are, uh, yeah, much smaller. And um, most of these deep sea isopods and amphipods, these things that look like wood lice or sand hoppers, are scavengers and they're really voracious uh, in the net and this is because food 
is at, at a very limited supply. And they're kind of extremely hungry all the time. Alex, um, well, we've got you know, we've got a couple of others, but I'm I'm very uh, conscious of time, um, and I think what I'm going to um, look at is is for classes. I'm going to say let let's just focus in on on, on the anglerfish as 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 because that's what they've got on the on the uh, student sheet, and then we we'll, we'll try and maximise the time for for Q and A as well. So. Um, with with the anglerfish, I think we've got um, some very obvious um, sort of adaptations it has, and we're talking about this sort of earlier. Can you take take us through a couple, and then then I'll then I'll see if I can remember any any as well. Uh, Twilight zone. So, um, that color also absorbs bioluminescent flashes, so it protects the animal from being seen by other predators. Uh, as I said, with the um, uh, bathynomus. Uh, the, the giant ice pod, uh, food is in short supply. So these anglerfish have uh, mouths which they can open extremely wide and a big stomach so they can really try and eat anything that they bump into. And you'll see those long and extremely sharp uh, teeth as well. And and, and then we, 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 we've got sort of, we've got the, the lure, yeah, the uh, light. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's literally like a, a luminous fish. And and be because they're uh, ambush predators, they're not like we saw the barracuda in the shallows earlier with that very sort of wonderful sort of streamlined shape. That's obviously using a a, a tactic like uh, speed to get your prey, and and this is this 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 looks different. Yeah, it is. And there's a good reason for that. As I said, food is in low supply. So the animals have to be energetically very efficient. And ambush predation is a very efficient way of catching your food. You don't chase it. You allow the food to come to you. And and you, 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 you're you conserving, conserving your energy. You're just, um, and, and your ambush predating predation is is this really just lying in wait and hiding and then surprising your your prey that's right yeah excellent excellent alex um wish we had longer to talk about adaptations and deep sea perhaps we can be which is amazing <laughs> curiosity is unbounded uh so if we take some time guys to, and classes to finish that off and you i think on your own time we're going to go straight in uh to some q and a and get through as many as possible. Just to say, it's wonderful to have. Uh, we've got a class from New York um, tuning in, and it's great to have you um, with us today. Okay, so from uh, Freddie, are all submersibles battery operated? Yes, they are. Perfect. There we go. It's quick fire, Alex. I like this. I like this. <laughs> yes. Um, how many arms can a submersible has have? Is there a maximum limit? Normally, uh, we operate with either one arm or two arms. And sometimes the arms might have slightly different functions. So you might have different grips on the two arms, but two is the usual maximum. Brilliant. Um, uh, Peyton would like to know, in your 50 dives, have you ever discovered a new species? Oh, uh, let me see. Yes, we have discovered new species. In fact, quite a few. Uh, we're in the process of describing some from the Maldives at the moment. Those include things like new species of corals. Amazing. Um, Freddie would also like to know, what is the longest a person has stayed down in the submersible? Well, typically the dives last for about seven or eight hours in a deep diving submersible um i would say the normal most extended dives are up to about 12 uh, 12 hours um we do carry emergency oxygen uh, on board the submersible so if there's a problem we need to be rescued in the case of this submersible here pisces 6 we have 120 hours of oxygen uh, on the submersible amazing amazing um 
Jay would like to know what is the deepest you've gone to? What's the, what's, what's the depth you've gone to? Uh, deepest I've been to is about 3,700 meters. That's, 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 that's very, that, that's very deep. It's pretty deep, yeah. It's not, it's not even the average depth of the ocean, though, which is about 4,200 meters. Wow. Wow. Uh, a couple of questions here, sort of joining uh, Liam's and another question up is, is what do you see, what do you do when you're down at the bottom at 3,700 odd, odd metres? What's... Well, <laughs> we do a number of things. First of all, we do surveys. So uh, we use video to map where life is living on the deep sea floor. And then we're collecting uh, samples of animals. And that's quite a delicate process it requires a lot of skill for the pilot to maneuver the submersible up to an organism an animal and then to delicately pick it with the manipulator some submersibles have what are called slurp guns uh, which is like an underwater vacuum cleaner which we can use to hoover up animals like crabs and snails Amazing. Thank you. Just just for classes uh, watching, please do vote if you can in the last these last sort of four minutes to upvote with a thumbs up button. Any questions you really, really, really want answered. Um, so I'm just going to go through them in order, uh, but there's some they'll, they'll pop up to the top of the list. Um, so we have we've got Amber was on how many species of sea life have you found? That's lots and lots and lots, and you um, you probably haven't got a number to hand. Have 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 have, have you? Oh gosh. I, I haven't got a number to hand, but I mean, I'll give you an example. We discovered the first deep sea hydrothermal vents in Antarctica. And there we recovered probably about 24 different species of animal living on the vents, every single one of which was new to science. So they were all first, first discovery. Amazing. Um... We've covered what a submersible is made of. Um, uh, here we go. This is, of course, an important question um, from um, Shazar. I think that's uh, that's how you pronounce it. Um, how old do you have to be to go in a submersible? Obviously itching uh, <laughs> to, to get into the deep. <laughs> well, I, I'm not aware of any age limit in terms of low age uh, to go in, in a submersible. You can... Uh, there are submersibles which operate as tourist operations and they take children down. Um, generally, uh, scientists are a uh, minimum of 18 to 21 years of age um, uh, before they can start working in vehicles like this. And, and and that's just because of the stage of your, your science career. You're at university, yeah. you're doing an undergraduate or postgraduate degree yeah absolutely yeah <clears throat> have you ever seen the titanic no i haven't <laughs> um the titanic is at about 3700 3800 meters i've never been to it um i've never actually seen a shipwreck from a submersible i've seen a lot of diving but not from the submarine we often do see human debris, though, so uh, tin cans, bottles, bits of plastic, that type of thing. Um, Amber would love to know, what is the biggest species of fish you've seen? Oh, gosh. Um, well, the biggest I've, I've seen from the uh, submersible is probably some of the um, uh, stingrays we actually saw uh, just a couple of days ago here, some very large stingrays. Um, I've been charged by a tiger shark um, in a submersible before. That was uh, quite big, probably three or four metres uh, long. Uh, and very territorial, so they see the submersible as a kind of invader in their territory. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the stingrays probably, well, the size of a uh, small dinner table, I think, is the best way to describe them. Wow. Um, Alex, uh, thank you so, so, so much. Um, it's been 
brilliant having you on uh this ocean census live lesson um all about your explorations being a submersible explorer um i could talk about this all day and i know the questions coming through from classes mean that they could probably spend the whole day learning from you all about the deep sea uh the amazing technology uh the amazing life and the amazing science uh in the deep um, so thank you um, to all those classes who've been watching. And Alex, thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. It's great to talk to you.